question about schizophrenia. Like, I agree with you that uh, a big part of it is just that our culture should should be more tolerant of people that are crazy. If there was a place for them, then maybe less of them would have to, would be warehoused off, like uh, people in, in less developed countries. They tend to do schizophrenics tend to do much better in those cultures. But my question is the fact that a lot of them really are suffering, and they really are suffering with the voices in their heads, and many of them do commit suicide because they're suffering so much with those voices, and some of them do see the hospital as a place, a safe place for them. And what, you know, how, do you, how do you balance those? those yeah, things? well, I think the paranoid kind of schizophrenia is different from this process schizophrenia. And, and, from having seen people in that state, it's clearly a very uncomfortable state. Uh, these people are not happy. They don't like being where they are. It doesn't seem like a very functional state. I think what we're dealing with is probably a, a, a group of pathologies that may or may not have common origins. These may be completely different screw-ups, chemical or genetic screw-ups of one sort or another. Uh, certainly the catatonic schizophrenic and the process schizophrenic present completely differently. The catatonic doesn't move, has nothing to say, can't care for their own body functions. The process schizophrenic wants to reorganize the company and call the president and to talk, uh, you know, invest and invent and travel and speak and heal, heal and cure and uh, they're just all over the map. It's a it's a whole different style. So, you know, in the, in the classification of fungi, they have this classification called uh, uh, fungi obscuranta. And it just means everything we haven't classified. And I think probably schizophrenia will be seen to be a, a group of unrelated phenomena requiring different kinds of inter intervention and different kinds of... Uh, therapy. You know, when the psychedelics were first coming on, everybody had the idea, aha, these things are what was called psychotomimetics. In other words, they imitate psychosis. And so then people said, well, it must be that people produce DM, that schizophrenics are overproducing DMT or they're producing LSD-like compounds in their blood. And people went tearing off in search of, of the schizogen it was called in the literature. Well, the schizogen was never found. Uh, schizophrenics have slightly depleted levels of DMT than the ordinary population, not dramatically depleted. Uh, no other chemical analog as a real marker for schizophrenia has... Uh, has been found, so it's, it's more complicated than that. And once you go back through the literature and compare with more attention to detail, the differences are clear. The paranoid schizophrenic hears voices. Visual hallucinations are actually pretty rare. Uh, hallucinogenic trips inevitably tend to be more positive than what schizophrenics are reporting. Uh, you know, you have only to contrast my encounters with zany, punning, self-transforming elf machines, compare that to these gray-faced proctologists who come in the middle of the night and look up your ass and take you off and, you know, abuse you and surgically snip and tuck. And, I mean, this is appalling stuff, the stuff of nightmare. If there was a drug that did that, none of us would get near it, I dare say, after one exposure. Yeah. Eight circuit model of evolution. Um, because I was thinking that, or it just sounds really close to what you were talking about, especially the neurogenetic level, where you can tune into the actual DNA and get a sort of a readout of the evolutionary process and pattern. So, um, yeah, I like the model. I'm not sure of the mechanism. Uh, on the other hand, one of the most mysterious issues in neurophysiology is the issue of memory. In other words, where is it? Uh, we know that in the course of your lifetime, every molecule in your body will be swapped out five times. 
well then how can a 70 year old woman remember the smell of her grandmother's dress when she used to climb up into her lap uh, you know we know that people can undergo horrific accidents brain damage and <laughs> cancer of the brain and this sort of thing and that their memory is in some cases virtually unscathed uh, this has been, in fact, the greatest embarrassment of materialist science in the past 50 years, or one of them is they have made zilch progress on understanding memory. And, you know, it's right smack in the center of everything we want to do. It's a communication technology. It's a nanotechnology. It's a molecular genetic technology for information and storage retrieval that works with images, music, sound. And we don't have a clue as to how it works. I, I, I tend to believe that nature is fairly conservative and that once you develop a mechanism that's good for a certain function, you will find it iterated in other areas where that function is called upon. So notice that the DNA, in a way, if you understand how it works, it's like a chemical learning system. It, it templates the environment and it responds to environmental selection by building proteins of a certain type. In a way, it, it, it's a chemical engine for responding uh, to the environment. Well, then if you look at the nervous system, it's an electrochemical system. It's a combinatory system where uh, information moves in the body down the nerve fibers at, at a pretty good clip. But why then are we such slow-moving creatures? Well, because every time it gets to a synaptic cleft, it stops being electricity and it turns into a complex chemical reaction to bridge the gap to go down the next wire to the next gap. And so in this, in the course of this electro to chemical to electro to chemical transmission of the signal, it slows down to a few hundred miles an hour. And that's, that determines our speed as organisms. Uh, downstream, this may all uh, be sped up. Memory seems to work almost instantaneously. But no mechanism is visible. I mean, if you really want to look at a human function that's present in all of us and easily studied and may hint at undiscovered principles in physics or miraculous new orders of nature, human memory would be a, a real place to begin, I think. And I wondered what your involvement is today, what you hope to get at, have hoped to get out of your involvement with the rave scene, and um, just what role do you think youth culture will have in the next 12, 13 years as we approach a possible singularity? Well, I didn't intend to get involved in rave, really. I mean, I was interested in it. I, when I went to England in 1990, uh, I had a pretty academic schedule of lecturing, but a lot of ravers came, and, and the zippies were just getting organized around the club called Megatripolis in Charing Cross. And I met Colin Shaman of The Shaman, and then... We talked about me doing something with them, and uh, and he taped our conversation, and then I thought it was like a job interview, but then when it was all over, he said that would do fine, that that was what they would use on the record, and that became, and then... So that CD was called Boss Drum, and just by chance it went double platinum in England, which means, hard to believe, but every 15th person in the British Isles bought this album. And so it was a mega hit, and suddenly I, I was an icon to a whole bunch of people who had never heard of me before. And then I worked with Zivuya, which was another English band, Tribal, a Spiral Tribe, which was an English band. I met a 
Austrian couple in Frankfurt who are Station Rose, which was a German doof band. And last year I went to South Africa and uh, and Australia and ended up doing raves there. It's a kind of a weird thing for a person my age uh, to you know be the world's oldest raver or something. <laughs> uh, but the rave scene needs to be more psychedelic. You know, it 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 get breaks down. It breaks toward amphetamine. It breaks toward heroin. It breaks toward alcohol. You have to keep constantly reminding it. Plus, the the youth culture is incredibly powerful and creative. You know, people talk about the 1960s and what a great thing it was. Well, I was there. I was at ground zero. And it lasted from about 1966 until 19, early 1968. And 1968 was called the the year of rage or the days of rage. That was all street fighting and rocking out bank windows and burning police cars. The summer of love, which was 1967, it was like a two-year thing, 66, 67. The current youth culture has been going in the same direction strong since 1986. There are people who will tell you if you were not in London in the summer of 88, you missed it. And, you know, and yet there are kids who obviously don't feel they missed it because they were children in 1988. Uh, so it's an incredibly vital culture. It's worldwide. It's high, it was born in the bowels of Thatcherite Britain. And it's very cynical about bourgeois social values and getting a job and fitting in and all that. And uh, it speaks German, Afrikaner, you know, Japanese, French, English with equal fluency. And uh, it's not rock and roll. You know, the ultimate heresy against the 60s musical fascisti uh, it's it's not rock and roll. It's doof. If it's anything, it comes out of hip hop. It's syncopated and and ambient and experimental. And I, you know, I I really don't understand the youth bashing tendency of this culture. It seems to me one of the most chuckle headed things that we're involved in is youth bashing because it all rides on the back of youth. They're the ones who are going to uh, be asked to live in and perfect the future that all this technology and integration and bioengineering and so forth and so on is going to bring to fruition. Uh, And the great thing about the youth culture, and there are many great things about it, but one is that it's so suspicious of bourgeois values and that it's so friendly to the internet. You know, the internet is owned and managed by the Fortune 500 corporations, but they own and manage it somewhat like a little old lady who owns a gorilla. They really fear it, and they don't understand it, and and they have to hire guys with rings in their ears and ponytails uh, to turn on the machines in the morning and to run the payroll software and the inventory control software and everything. So it's a very uneasy uh, alliance. Um, as far as whether I'll do more with rave culture, I don't know. I keep trying to back out of it. It's... It's different, it's strange to go on stage in front of a screaming crowd at 2 a.m. and try to talk philosophy. And so I've given up trying to talk philosophy and instead I find myself behaving more incoherently and uh, crazily than I do in any other fashion. And the crowd seems to love it, but the crowd is predisposed to love it. Uh, the crowd is not terribly discriminating uh, at that point. But I have been working with a band called Lost at Last, a Maui band transplanted to Santa Cruz. And if you're in San Francisco, New Year's Eve, we'll be at the Veterans Administration 
doing glossolalia and handling boa constrictors with light show and the whole razzmatazz. <laughs> if only this had come when I was 20. It's, it's, I feel like Billy Pilgrim or something. <laughs> I'm living my life entirely out of sequence. I mean, what does a 51 year old guy need with a career as a raver? <laughs> Beats the shit out of me, but there you have it. You know, and I'm poor enough, I can't just say no either. I have to negotiate this stuff. Oh, yeah, it's a shamanic role for sure. I mean, jumping Jack Flash, it's a gas, gas, gas. For sure, it's a shamanic role. Uh, but I'm sure, I mean, it would be perfectly reasonable to stand aside and let a 22-year-old do it, to let Spooky do it, let somebody else do it. Yeah. Um, with all your talk about the, the proctologists who come in the night, what do you think about uh, the extraterrestrials? I thought you would never ask. <laughs> <laughs> well, first of all, before I wade in, visor down, razors flashing, let me say that I have at times proposed various extraterrestrial theories, because it seemed to me back in the mid-70s that if you were to take seriously the idea that there was an extraterrestrial penetration of the terrestrial ecology, that the mushroom would be it. The mushroom is alien enough in its life cycle, alien enough to survive the conditions of outer space, and when complexed with a mammalian nervous system, it seems to want to download these messages from far away, shall we say. So that's my idea of, of how an alien would be. That the first problem you would have with a real alien would be to recognize it. Because first of all, it's going to be alien, for crying out loud. This thing evolved on some other planet under a completely different chemical and regime of pressure and chemistry and and I mean if you can't understand your next door neighbor do you th what do you think it's going to be like to stare into the face if it has a face of somebody from Zanabal Ganubi so uh, the mushroom seemed alien enough and it's also very low key it looks high technology I don't expect them to come in trillion ton ships of titanium uh, uh, roaring out of the cosmic darkness into parking orbit around our planet. I seriously doubt if it will happen that way. I, if they don't want to be detected, they certainly will not be detected because you have to assume that the, uh, the, the technology will be beyond your wildest imaginings. Uh, the idea that someone is going to come in ships speaking languages and with an interest in our gross industrial output or trading with us or some crap like that. This is what I call failure of scale. This is for people who don't understand how weird reality is. This is for people who've been watching too much daytime TV to think it's going to be so humdrum as that. Uh, well, so then we're left with this residuum of testimony that something weird is going on. I think this is like a built, an intelligence test built into reality. Uh, life presents itself as a mystery. The people who pass the intelligence test are not worrying about gray-faced aliens checking them for hemorrhoids in the middle of the night. They have passed this intelligence test and their conclusion is, whatever this is, it is not what it claims to be. It is not what it uh, appears to be. Uh, and then people are very puzzled and they say, well, but what about all these people who have these things happen to them? Well, this now we sort of get down to the nut of the matter. And, and this is where I often feel my audience is peeling away from me.